The sun had not yet risen and John was woken from a deep sleep by his boss. John, Mercedes flying back to London tonight. Make sure we have the plane ready to go by 10. After a month of leisure at a cosy hotel in Wales, John was glad to have something to do, even if it meant flying his employer's spoilt wife back home to Johannesburg. He disliked her intensely. She was rude and loud and had an annoying tendency to break wind every time she passed him. As he waited for Mercedes at the private hangar at Stansted, John went over the weather charts one more time. He wasn't happy with the clouds forming over Central Africa, but he figured he could fly over most of them if they hadn't already cleared by the time he reached them. After all, there was no way he could tell Mercedes that they couldn't fly today. His experience with her over the last couple of years has taught him to keep such thoughts himself. If she didn't get her way, she could make life very difficult for everyone she came in contact with, and it could be the end of his very well-paid position. After a wait for about 30 minutes, he saw the company car pull into the hangar. He got out of the plane to meet it, and when the car door opened, he noticed that Mercedes was conservative dressed for a change. She held out her hand, which he took in his, and noticed her fingernails were painted a garish blue colour. He had never seen her nails painted in that colour before, but nothing surprised him about Mercedes. He quickly escorted her to the plane and showed her to her seat. No conversation was exchanged, and no wind passed. And boy, was he glad about it. The plane took off without incident. John would have liked to switch to autopilot, but the weather made him nervous. After about an hour and he hadn't heard from Mercedes, he assumed that she had fallen asleep, and this helped him relax a little. As he approached the clouds over Central Africa, he saw the weather had graduated to a thunderstorm. He pulled the aircraft up, attempting to fly over the clouds, but he couldn't avoid them. As the clouds enveloped the aircraft, he kept it in an incline, hoping to break through in a few seconds and reach clearer air. That's when the lightning bolt struck the engine. John woke with a start. The cold forest floor had chilled his body, making him numb. Memories of the night before came flooding back. He again felt the panic, the terror of feeling of the plane stall and relived the drop from the sky. The lightning strike had roasted the controls. Nothing worked. With the plane engine spluttering, he grabbed the emergency kit and got out of the cabin to where Mercedes was. When he saw her, she had the same panic and terror in her eyes that he had. He groped under a seat for her emergency kit and pulled it out. He handed her the orange life jacket and put it on his own. He then put on his parachute pack and turned to, to face her. She hadn't moved. John shouted for her to wear the life jacket and then screamed it again as she still hadn't responded. He grabbed her arms and forced them through the opening in the life jacket. He did the same with the parachute pack and pulled her towards the door. He again noticed those blue fingernails as she scratched his arm while she fought against him. He managed finally to open the door which let in a blast of cold, wet wind. It was then he felt the plane violently start to vibrate and pitch into a more violent descent. He moved Mercedes closer to the door and told her what he was going to do. He didn't know if she heard him over the sound of the wind and the engine, but she started screaming as the reality finally sunk in. Without warning, he pushed her out of the plane and a few seconds, he jumped out himself. He saw Mercedes tumbling through the air for a few moments, after which her parachute self-deployed and shielded him from his eyes as a white canopy opened up above her. His own parachute deployed, but the buffering wind took him in a different direction. By the time he turned back towards her, all he could see were the clouds and the occasional lightning bolt. Luckily, he landed on the ground in a small clearing in the forest. He landed on his feet, but instantly collapsed onto his back, hitting his head on a large tree, leaving him unconscious for some time. When he came round, he jumped to his feet, but didn't know what he should do first. He found some ray water caught in the cavity of a large leaf, which he drank. He then tried to remember all the survival tactics that he was taught in flight school. He knew he was in Central Africa rainforest due to the flight pan, and civilization would be a long way off in all directions. He took out the compass in his emergency kit and started to head west. John had stumbled through the thick jungle for at least 24 hours. He was tired and desperately needed sleep. He wanted to conserve food in the packets in the emergency kit, so he ate a few berries that he found in the forest. That was not a good idea. He quickly fell violently ill, spewing all the food he had eaten in the last 24 hours onto the ground. His energy now was completely depleted and he needed rest. So he spread his parachute canopy on the ground and collapsed onto it into a deep sleep. John was roughly awakened. Something was poking him. His eyes shot open and he sat up. The first thing he saw was a small child. Then he saw there were several other small children behind the first one. He tried to stand up but fell heavily on back to the ground. He heard the children laughing and realised they were tied his hands and feet together. He looked at the children in a questioning manner and then suddenly realised in fact they were not children at all. They were fully grown men.
The men picked a thick stick and slid it between his tied legs and arms, and six of them carried him through the jungle like a captured animal. By the time they reached their village, John's wrists and ankles were rubbed raw against the stick. His arms were ready to pop out of the sockets, and he was bleeding. They dumped him on the ground and untied his wrists and feet. The pain was so intense that John passed out. Some time had passed when John woke up to find his wounds had been cared for and four men inspecting him. He stood up quickly, but sat down again just as fast as two of the men raised their spears and gestured that they would throw them if he moved again. The other two men continued inspecting him as if they had nothing happened. They raised his arms and checked them, then they did the same with his legs. They kept shaking their heads, and after about five minutes of poking and prodding, they walked off mumbling between themselves, and the two armed men followed, but they kept their spears pointed at him until they were out of sight. John slowly looked around his environment and saw that he was placed in the centre of a shaded clearing in the jungle. He was surrounded by a thick wall of thorn bushes which looked very formidable. The other side of the wall was probably safe to touch though, because as the men went out from the opening in the wall, they pushed it closed again with their bare hands. After a while, two men came back into the clearing. One had the usual spear while the other carried a wooden bowl and a stone slab. The stone slab had strips of meat on it and had recently been roasted on a fire and seasoned with something that smelled like wild ginger. The bowl contained a clear liquid with large chunks of meat in it. As soon as John saw the food, he realised just how hungry he really was. He waited for the men to place the food on the ground before him and as soon as they had stepped out of the clearing, he grabbed the food and started to devour it. The meat strips were quite chewy but juicy and full of flavour. The soup was also tasty, though he would have preferred a little more meat in it. After consuming the simple yet plentiful meal, he lay down on the ground. Now he had to figure out a way to escape from these people. Sure, they had fed him and not harmed him yet, but he didn't know how long this would continue. Four days passed, and John was becoming surprisingly comfortable in his new surroundings. He had food three times a day. He was given his parachute canopy to sleep on, and they didn't disturb him at all. In fact, if it wasn't for the armed man who came in with the food, he would have thought they were a very peaceful tribe. The armed guard actually made sense though when John thought about it. He would probably go through the same thing in any country where he arrived without permission. To be honest, they had probably not seen a European man before and were not sure what to make of him and were just being careful. John was no longer afraid. He had started talking to the man who brought him his food. He started off talking softly with a lot of smiles and gestures and a basic form of communication was soon established. Yesterday they had shaken hands. John tried to find out the man's name and after many hand signs and pointing came to the conclusion it must be Mbagnu. John then decided that after a few more days he would convince them to let him out of the enclosure. He figured he would probably live there for a few weeks and then begin to long trek back to civilization. He wondered which direction he would head off to first but there again he would have to know which country he was in before he started his journey. But John wasn't worried. He had plenty of time to think about it. Just then, his new friend of Bagnu stepped into the clearing with the usual bowl and slab of rock. He placed him on the ground in front of John and smiled at him. John smiled back and waved, and Bagnu waved back and then stepped back through the opening and shut it behind him. John quickly finished off the meat strips and picked up the bowl. He drank some of the liquid before fishing out the remaining meat. The first piece was slender and had more bones than usual, and because of its shape, he rotated it in his mouth as he stripped the meat from the bone just as you would with a miniature sweet corn hub. It was then he saw it, a blue fingernail. Instantly turning white with the horrific realization of what he saw, he dropped the bowl and began to scream in pure panic as the terrifying reality sank in that he was next. <laughs>